for as long as you want. Okay, so I do need to use this microphone. So the green light is on. I think we're good. I wanted to start by thanking Gloria and the Global Change Center and um, Emily for bringing our snacks outside out front today. And also thank you all for coming to see this talk and hear what I've been doing for the last four years. And to those who are tuning in online, including Leanne. I'm going to start with an outline of the talk today. I'm going to give you some background on sediment and macroinvertebrates and then talk through the three research chapters of my dissertation. These look at this sediment management program problem on um, three different scales, starting at a national level, then moving into the state of Virginia. Yes? Uh, is there a sign hanging up? I don't know what that means. Okay. Can you ask her to look, watch YouTube? Because she wants me to sign her into Skype, which we weren't, we can't do from up here. Y O U T U B. Sorry, my phone's not working very well on here. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I just. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then we'll focus in on the stream reach for the third study. And then I'll summarize and give us some conclusions. So sediment is a natural and really important component of all surface water systems. And um, however, sediment imbalance, normally too much fine sediment in the system can cause problems. Humans, when we manipulate our landscape through construction or urbanization, agriculture, and resource extraction, we increase the amount of erosion in the watershed. And that can lead to excess inputs of fine sediment into our surface waters. And these sediments can have attached to them toxins or extra nutrients that can cause problems to the water body or the organisms that live in it. But even if the sediment doesn't have anything attached to it, so if it's a clean sediment, as I call it, that can also cause physical stress to the environment. And that physical stressor of clean sediment is what my dissertation research has focused on. So when sediment enters the stream channel, it can take three physical forms. It can remain suspended in the water column as a particle. It can dissolve in the water column as an ion, or it can settle to the stream bed. And it can change between these forms based on water temperature and flow rates and other physical and chemical traits of the water body. Each of these forms of sediment can have impacts on the organisms living in the stream system. And so of all of the types of things that live in the stream, the, I've chosen to focus on benthic macroinvertebrates. And I've done this for a few different reasons. One is they are commonly used in bioassessment. Bioassessment is the process by which we look at the things living in an area to evaluate the health of that area. They're relatively immobile so that we know when we're looking at a, a community of insects in one space, we're getting information about the health of that space. And they also have a wide range of responses to a variety of stressors. They play multiple roles in the food web and in the ecosystem. And without a healthy macroinvertebrate community, we won't have a healthy functioning ecosystem. So based on what I just said, the things we know are that sediment is a substantial problem for surface waters in the US. I think I actually forgot to tell you <laughs> that fine sediment, excess fine sediment, is the second largest problem for water bodies in the United States. We know that sediment can exist in a variety of physical forms and that each of these forms can impact aquatic life. In terms of what we don't know, that leads to my research questions. First, how important is a sediment as a stressor specifically for this benthic macroinvertebrate community? Second, what forms of sediment have the most impact on benthic macroinvertebrates and what are the thresholds for those effects? And how can we track these particles to improve our estimates of their fate and transport within the stream system? And this is important when it comes to remediating streams that have too much fine sediment. So our first question, how important is sediment as a stressor to the macroinvertebrate community? My objectives here were first to identify how many states in the US actually use this community to evaluate the health of their surface waters. And then to figure out when we have streams that are impaired based on this community, what are the primary stressors that are causing that impairment? And where does sediment fall in that list of stressors? So the data set I used to get at this question is the national water quality data set that's collected by all of the states and then reported to the US EPA. The Clean Water Act reporting cycle includes states assessing the quality of their waters, 
and making a determination if those waters are impaired or if they're healthy. If they are impaired, they're placed on what's called the 303D list, which is a list of impaired waters. That's the section of the Clean Water Act that that is um, under. Impaired waters will then enter a process called the total maximum daily load process. And this is a process by which we determine what the cause of impairment is, so what pollutant or stressor is causing the problem. And then a loading limit is developed. And that loading limit reflects a level of the pollutant that the stream can handle and still maintain a healthy community. A watershed implementation plan is developed to kind of, it's like a plan to help you get that, the water back into a healthy state. And the ultimate goal is restoring that water body. So to determine which states conduct macroinverter bioassessment, um, each state gets to choose the method they want to use to assess their surface waters. They all have to report that information to the EPA, but they can use whatever method they want to. But they do have to make public their approach. And so I simply checked the uh, assessment methods for each state to determine if they used this community to evaluate stream health. And this map of the US, every state that is in color, including Puerto Rico, whoopsie, which is here in color, um, those are states that do use this method to assess uh, community health. And they're color coded by the region of the EPA. And we see that 47 of 57 US states and territories use this community to evaluate the health of their surface waters. So when we have an uh, impairment of a stream that's identified based on a biotic community, it is not straightforward to know what the cause of that problem is because these organisms are reflecting exposures to a variety of stressors over long periods of time. So we need to figure out what could it be, and it could be more than one thing. So for example, it could be uh, heavy metals or stream effluent, nutrients or spills, or it could be more natural, non-chemical pollutants such as habitat conditions, flow rates, pH, temperature, and perhaps the buildup of fine sediment. So the approach I used to figure out the primary pollutants involved with these impairments was to first look at finalized total maximum daily load reports. I needed to look at reports that were already approved, had gone through that process because we needed to have the stressor identification kind of signed off on by the EPA and the state. From that uh, list of, improve, or of uh, approved TMDL reports, I needed to identify water bodies that had been classified as impaired based on this particular kind of assessment, and then link up to the, the pollutant that was identified in that report. So to do this, I used the EPA's publicly available water quality assessment database called ATTAINS. This is uh, on the web. First, identifying approved total maximum daily loads that had been linked to having impaired biota. There were 998 of those. And so from this point, I needed to figure out which of those were linked to the benthic macroinvertebrate community. In some cases, this, the states have to list a cause of impairment, and sometimes it's easy to tell it's not related to insects. So they might be something like fish kills or paraphyton analysis that we can say, okay, that's not insects. We don't have to look at that further. In other cases, they very clearly say this was based on a benthic macroinvertebrate impairment or some kind of benthic or invertebrate terminology. And those were counted in into this evaluation. And then there was this middle category, which was kind of more vague. It would include terms like maybe multiple um, communities or biology. And in that case, I needed to actually go in and search the individual total maximum daily load reports. So this ant just reminds me that's, that's what I was doing in the holidays of 2015, was reading all of these reports. And it was a lot of reports, but also too, uh, important thing to note here is that that means that the EPA database was not able to give me the information I needed because I had to go into the individual state reports to get this information. And in those cases, I needed to check, did they evaluate macroinvertebrates? Was there a problem? And based on that analysis, I identified 646 streams that had impairments that were identified based on this macroinvertebrate community. Uh, once I had those identified, sometimes the attains database would have a very clear pollutant linked to that, and I could just take note of that. In other cases, again, they would have some kind of vague terminology in that database. So then again, I would go back to the total maximum daily load approved report to figure out what the pollutant was. Because you can have more than one pollutant for 
the, each impaired stream, there were uh, 931 total pollutants identified. So that's a lot. So after all that, I have generated a single graph to <laughs> consolidate this information. This graph shows stressors identified in 5% or more of the streams with macroinvertebrate impairments. Again, they're color-coded by EPA region. You can see that we have some metals, we have aluminum and iron, we have some of these nitri nitrogen and phosphorus nutrients, organic pollutants, stormwater is co commonly associated with the urban storm flow. And then these last three categories on, the, on your right, sediment, siltation, and total suspended solids, these are all linked to sediment in the environment. So sediment is clearly uh, the most common cause of macroinvertebrate impairments based on the Clean Water Act reporting. But also draw your attention to the number of green um, colors here. That's US EPA Region 3. That is the region of the EPA that Virginia sits in. And in Virginia, 88% of the impaired waters that were impaired based on macroinvertebrate bioassessment were linked to sedimentation. So that becomes relevant when we get to our second question. To, su to summarize this section, we did identify sediment as the primary cause of these impairments based on Clean Water Act reporting, and that was nationwide. And also, we uncovered some complications with the Clean Water Act reporting approach. It definitely does what it intends to do in terms of reporting to the EPA what the states, you know, their level of impaired waters, but it is pretty difficult to make multiple state, cross-state conclusions based on how the data set is, is um, arranged. All right, so we know sediment's a problem. We know it's a problem in Virginia. My second question was what forms of sediment have the most impact on this community of um, macroinvertebrates? The objectives here were to identify the parameters that had the strongest influence on an index of macroinvertebrate health that is used in Virginia, and then based on the identification of those parameters to develop sensitivity thresholds for them. In Virginia, stream aquatic life health is evaluated using an index of macroinvertebrate health called the Virginia Stream Condition Index, or the VSCI. It is comprised of eight metrics. They consist of things like taxon richness, taxon composition, diversity, tolerance, and trophic groups. And this index is basically collected. The, the state biologists go out, collect the insect community, identify the families that are in that community, and count them, and then can calculate these, these biological metrics. The index ranges from zero to 100, and anything above 61, 61 or above is um, considered to be a healthy community. So that was my um, independent variable, and I'm trying to figure out how we can predict that variable based on nine sediment metrics. The metrics I looked at were suspended metrics included total suspended solids and turbidity, and turbidity is how much light can get through the water. The dissolved metrics were total dissolved solids and conductivity. Conductivity is the electrical um, transfer potential of the water. And then bedded traits, I looked at bed stability, which is essentially the particle size distribution that you see versus what you would expect to see based on the geometric traits of your system. Um, embeddedness, which is how much larger particles are buried by smaller sand and fine particles. And three measures of grain size distribution, so that's um, the median particle size, the percent sand, and the percent fine particles. The data set I used was collected between 2004 and 2014 by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, and it is covering five of seven ecoregions in the state. So each of these different colors is a different ecoregion. I didn't use these two eastern regions because that's the coastal plain, and they use a different metric to evaluate stream health in that, in that area. The three blue ecoregions comprise the mountain bioregion, and the two green ecoregions comprise the Piedmont bioregion. In all in all, there were 375 data points. It's also important to note that the locations were based on an EPA um, probabilistic selection pr process that essentially means that the locations are considered randomly identified. And the statistics here uh, is essentially a, t it's a type of regularized regression. So it's similar to a linear regression, which some of you will be familiar with. The um, dependent variable is the VSCI score. 
each of these X's, one through nine is one of those nine sediment parameters. Uh, the letters are going to tell us how important each of those sediment parameters are. Uh, this is a cool model because as in a regular linear regression, the overall goal is still to minimize the error in our ability to predict this VSCI score. But this, this method also has two penalty terms, and they are important for this, for this particular analysis because, one, the first penalty term accounts for sparsity. So that means if, if I have a parameter that's really not telling me anything, I can kick it out of the model. So I won't have to have nine parameters all the time if they don't actually tell me anything. And it allows me to focus in on what, on what really matters to this VSP score. And the second one is grouping. Um, so as you might realize, there's nine sediment parameters. They're all somehow related to sediment. So there's a good chance that they do correlate with one another in some regard. And this error term accounts for that grouping. So it will not just pick one of those parameters that matters. It'll keep them both in my model. The thing to note when you're interpreting the results of this method is that the coefficient, so those letters, the coefficient with the largest absolute value is the coefficient that has the most strong influence on your VSCI score. So the tables I'm gonna show you now are gonna be a bunch of coefficients. We just care about which ones are the biggest. So first, I did this analysis on the VSCI score for those five ecoregions together, so all the data points that I showed you on that map. Here in these um, figures, you're going to see red font means the top three parameters that were linked to the response, and bold font is the top parameter. And so here we can see that the bedded traits were more influential in this VSCI score than either dissolved or suspended sediment traits. In addition to looking at that big index itself, I looked at the eight metrics that made up that index, and I'm just showing you three of them here, but we had similar patterns for each of them. And that was, again, that um, these bedded traits, particularly embeddedness, played an important role in those responses. And then in addition, because um, organisms can adapt to their environments and they might have a different evolutionary history with different areas, we do anticipate that there will be differences in how they respond to stressors based on where they live. So I looked at this combined bioregion is the same data that was on the previous slide, and then divided the data into mountain and Piedmont bioregions. Here we see that the mountain region had a very similar response to what we saw in the combined bioregion. However, the Piedmont bioregion, in that case, we also saw conductivity played an important role in the VSCI response. So based on these data, I um, moved forward with looking at conductivity and embeddedness as the traits that I would develop these thresholds for. So what are the sensitivity thresholds for embeddedness and conductivity? The approach here is uh, similar to the data that I just was talking about. Each of those sample stations have data on embeddedness, data on co conductivity, and then these biological count data. At this point, we're moving away from looking at the index itself, and we're looking at the raw count data. So that's how many of this type of insect, how many of, of this type of insect. The response is extirpation. That is the absence of a species from an, an, an area or the functional absence. So basically, there's not enough of them there to serve their role in the ecosystem. And the goal is to figure out what level of embeddedness or conductivity will result in us losing 5% of the insect families in our area. And we don't want that to happen, so that's like our safety level. This is kind of the same as being protective of 95% of your insect families. The approach for each family uh, that was collected, I, I calculated a level at which the family is absent. So for each family, I calculate what's called an extirpation concentration, so when it leaves. And then I uh, assembled those data into a cumulative distribution function for all families and identified the stressor level at which 5% of them left. So that is the threshold, the sensitivity threshold. This process was repeated six times, three for embeddedness, three for conductivity, and then both for the combined bioregion, Piedmont and mountain bioregions. And to kind of give you a little closer uh, view of what this looks like, here's an example of um, the bizarre caddisfly family of insects. This species is sensitive to embeddedness. So here we have the embeddedness gradient from zero to 100, the probability of observing a species based on how embedded your environment is decreases with more embeddedness. So this species 
is less likely to be observed the more embedded your habitat. In this case, at 65% embeddedness, you have less than a 5% chance of observing the species. So for this family of insects, um, the extirpation concentration is 65%. And in contrast, here's a species that is not sensitive to embeddedness, and in fact, it's actually more probable that you'll find it in more embedded conditions. This is the broad-winged damselfly. And in this case, our extirpation concentration is identified at 100%. With those data, they're on this graph in the following manner. So our non-sensitive species had 100%, it's graphed here. 65% is graphed here. And now we're looking at our proportion of all invertebrate families. Uh, and we're interested in the 5% proportion. And that's 68%. And that gives us our threshold. So the threshold for embeddedness here for the combined bioregions is 68%. So that's the process. And based on that, our results are as follows. The 68% here. Underneath each of these is a 95% confidence interval in that threshold, and that was uh, generated via a bootstrapping technique. Here, to what's interesting to notice is, again, the response in the mountain in combined re bioregions was pretty similar. <laughs> Tony doesn't know what he agrees with that. Uh, and in the Piedmont bioregion, we saw a distinct response different from what we found in the mountain bioregion. So, Organisms in the Piedmont bioregion were less sensitive to embeddedness, but more sensitive to conductivity than what we were seeing in the mountain bioregion. This reinforces the importance of really looking at regional differences and when you're trying to figure out sensitivity thresholds for these organisms. So to summarize here, uh, the effects threshold varied by bioregion. So as I just said, it's really important to make sure we're not gonna come up with a number that works for the country as a whole, or even for the state as a whole. We're really gonna have to think about uh, regional specific values. Uh, these thresholds should be refined as we get more data. The state of Virginia it does collect data on the genus level, but hasn't been doing that for enough years that I felt we had enough data to work uh, this approach with, with the genus level data. Uh, these thresholds could be used to help in that process of identifying what is the problem when we have multiple st stressors that could be impacting our communities and to help set restoration endpoints um, when we're trying to clean up our streams. And finally, embeddedness uh, showed a pretty high importance to these communities, and it might warrant more focus in monitoring and restoration work. This is a tricky parameter because it's somewhat subjective. When you go out, you judge how buried are these particles. There are some more less subjective, more kind of technology-based ways to measure this, but it's something that we're gonna have to think about. So now that we know that embeddedness matters and some of these other parameters matter, we have to figure out uh, how we can you know, really get into the stream itself and figure out what's going on to make sure that our actions we take to restore the stream are gonna be effective. So at this point, I'm looking at how do we track the particles of sediment in the stream channel itself so that we can find out more about the fate and transport of these particles within the stream channel. My objectives here were to quantify the sediment transport and deposition within a study reach. So this is a reach in Virginia that I'll describe. And I used rare earth elements as a tracer, and I will describe those also in just a second. And I wanted to evaluate the efficiency of using multiple rare earth elements in series to see if we could get at some um, evidence of re-suspension of these particles in the stream channel. And finally, finally look at how far down the stream these particles are traveling. Sediment tracing essentially is a method by which we mark the sediment in some way so that we can identify it from what's naturally in the channel. We then inject it into the channel, and then we go find out where it went. So we go sample and figure out, did it go in the floodplain? Did it go through the channel in the water column? And this gives us a feel for where that sediment's going on a somewhat regular basis. As I said, we used rare earth elements to label the sediment. Rare earth elements are naturally occurring elements. They're not, um, they're not present in very high concentrations naturally in the background, so that's good. They're trivalent cations, so that means they have really strong positive charges and they like to stick to soil. And to label the sediments, you simply add them in solution, in a salt solution to your sediment and they'll attach. And so I did that in two separate batches, one with lanthium, one with ytterbium, 
and was able to generate rare earth elemented, element labeled sediments with uh, rare earth element concentrations three to four orders of magnitude greater than background concentrations. And these were uh, representative of medium silts, so that's an average diameter of about 17 micrometers. This study was conduct conducted at Docks Branch, which is associated with the stream lab at Virginia Tech. It was an 80 meter reach, approximately a meter in bankful width, and pretty shallow slope of 0.01 meters per meter. You can just see the water channel here, and it wraps its way down past these trees. So here, what we are doing is um, measuring flow at two points along this channel. And the upstream end of the channel, the flow is running from right to left on your screen. At this upstream end, we had an H flume that measured flow. At the downstream end, we installed an acoustic Doppler velocimeter to measure flow. Here is a road crossing with a culvert. And what we did was generate two artificial flood events during which we were going to inject these sediments. So for each event, we blocked that culvert, allowed the stream to backwater for like four or five hours, and then released the blockage. And once that flood pulse reached the H flume, we injected the sediments at the nape of the flume. So throughout, once that flood pulse was traveling through that stream channel, we were collecting water samples with three pumps, and those were collected at 30 second intervals for the first two minutes and at one minute intervals for each of the following 10 minutes. I looked at collecting the deposition by putting uh, AstroTurf mats in the channel. So these are 15 centimeter square mats that were pinned either to the stream valweg or the near floodplain in triplicate at each of three sample locations. Those were collected the day after the flood once the waters had returned to base flow. And then we looked at longitudinal transport. So how far is it going? This is our main study, study reach with the flume. We had these um, triplicate in time integrated suspended sediment samplers. They're essentially PVC tubes with a funnel on the front. And when the water level rises high enough that goes through that funnel, the sediment settles down and we can collect it afterward. During the first and second flood, we had those samplers at 90 meters. And during the second flood, also located at 850 meters downstream. So this study was conducted in conjunction with another study that was looking at water um, river floodplain conductivity in this channel. So between the first and second floods, we installed three pieces of large wood in the channel. So processing sediment, basically what we needed to do here was we had a lot of water and a lot of sediment, and we needed to separate the water from the sediment. So with the help of gravity, and a pump and a little child labor, we removed literally a ton, 908, 907 kilograms of water from these samples. To evaluate the rare earth element concentrations, those sediments, um, I digested them with a microwave, lab grade microwave acid digestion technique. And the solution was then sent to the civil engineering lab for ICP MS analysis for the rare earth elements. And particle size was analyzed on this Silas particle size analyzer machine. At this point, when I go into the results, I'm going to switch from the aerial view here to this more kind of stylistic view of the reach. And I'm also going to focus on this first cross section and third cross section because we have the most complete picture of what's going on at those areas. So flow rates. Uh, this is where we injected the sediment into the flume. We were trying to generate two floods with similar flow rates, and we did a pretty good, pretty good job here of generating pretty close hydrographs. The flow rates at this first cross-section, we didn't have anything at that cross-section to measure flow rate, but Tyler Keyes, who's here today, created a HECRES model as part of our broader study and was able to generate these cross-sections, these hydrographs for flows at that area. And again, you see at this point, it's still pretty similar. But once we get past the main portion of the reach, we do start seeing, uh, these are data based on this ADV, uh, a delay in the flood pulse and a slight weakening of the flood pulse in the second flood, which is likely related to having wood in the channel during that flood. <laughs> 
suspended sediment transport. This graph looks a little crazy because uh, the second flood is much lower, but I think what happened here is that we just missed the bulk of that um, sediment pulse. It's probably much more similar based on our other data. I'm gonna switch this graph to a different um, scale so that we can compare it with our other graphs I'm gonna show you. Here in our second, in our cross section three, our second measurement point, we can see that sediment uh, in suspension is definitely less and slower at reaching this, uh, this cross section here. That's again, something we would expect based on the wood in the channel. And then here's the data, similar pattern for our third cross section. Based on these graphs, you can calculate the velocity at which the sediment is traveling through the stream channel. And so the first flood, we had a 0.25 meter per second sediment pulse, and in the second flood, 0.18 meters per second going through that channel. So those flow data that I showed you and these total suspended sediment data for each of these points is then combined with rare earth element concentrations for these samples, and that allows us to, ev to evaluate how much of our tracer could we recover at different points in the stream. So for the first flood, we used this lanthium tracer, and at this point, I'm just gonna talk about the data from the first flood. Uh, we got similar results for the second flood. Again, we injected 100% of the tracer at this flume point here. And based on our calculations, we could recover or account for 18% of that tracer at the first cross section. And that's in suspension in the water column moving through the channel. However, we also calculated 18% at 66 meters downstream, and I'm gonna, we, I have figured out why that is. Uh, that suggests, though, that there's no deposition happening in this middle station, which isn't actually very logical and also doesn't agree with our depositional data. However, if we look at the elevation cross-section of this area, so this is looking as if you cut the stream and we're looking from upstream to downstream. This is the stream bank and then the deepest part of the channel and then onto the floodplain. You can see that this point here is the point at which our pump was installed in the water channel. So that's where we're drawing this water where we're getting our total suspended solid estimate. And that point needs to estimate on average the sediment conditions in this entire cross section. It's unlikely to be doing a good job at that because one, it's only in this very deep area and also sediment will, will uh, separate in the water column based on their size and weight. So you're gonna have heavier sediments here, lighter sediments here. In our third cross section, it's a much tighter area, and it's much more likely to have a better uh, estimate of representing the water to total suspended sediment concentrations in that, in that region. So based on that, I put more confidence on the estimates of the third cross section, and I'm concluding that about 18% of the sediment that we injected is passing through that reach channel within 66 meters. That means that about uh, 82% is being deposited either in the channel here or in this near floodplain. So we can do that estimate as well with the depositional data. Uh, in this case, it's based on the aerial concentration where the sediment could deposit in the stream channel here or in this um, strip of floodplain. And again, based on the rare earth element concentrations that we were collecting on the deposition mats. And here I am calculating that 77% of our um, tracer is depositing in this very first sector of the reach. That does line up somewhat with our 18% estimate that we didn't trust to begin with, um, but it's a little high. And also, when you consider that I calculate an additional 86% is depositing in the floodplain, I'm getting numbers that are theoretically not possible. So what this tells me is that we are having, we have a pretty high heterogeneity in deposition in this area, and our samples are not capturing the variability in deposition here. Regardless of that, we can conclude that the majority of the sediment is being deposited in the reach, either in the floodplain or channel, um, and that's important for when we are trying to figure out where these particles are going when we're restoring the streams. Finally, in terms of longitudinal transport, in each storm, so in our first flood, or in both storms we had samples collected here, and in both cases we found the tracer there. So we know it's at least getting to 90 meters. In our second flood, we had um, the tracers at this 850 meter point, 
I did catch the tracer injected in the second flood in those samples, and I also collected tracer injected in the first flood in those samples, which means that that tracer has resuspended and moved out of the reach, at least to that distance. So that tells us a lot about um, how some particles stay in the reach and how some particles get out in the first try, some particles it takes a couple tries to get out, these patterns of potential of what each particle might end up doing. To summarize here, we saw that the rare earth element tracers enabled us to quantify transport, suspension, and deposition and resuspension in the flood plain and in the stream channel. Most of the sediment injected into the stream entered storage, which means was deposited within the first 66 meters of the reach, and then although some particles did make it all the way out of the reach. And we recommend that in future studies we kind of increase our spatial resolution both within the water channel and within the depositional samples on the flood plain. So what did we find out from these studies? What do we know now? Our first research question was how important is sediment as a stressor for these communities? We determined that it was, in the case of evaluation of Clean Water Act data, it was the most important thing. Uh, and so nobody had been able to figure that out before. It seems somewhat, it's not surprising, but it uh, was nice to kind of have some concrete evidence of that. Uh, what forms of sediment had the most impact on these macroinvertebrates and what were the thresholds of effect? We found that in Virginia, embeddedness and conductivity were very important for these communities, and the thresholds really depended on where you were in the state. And then how are we going to or how can we track these particles to improve our estimates of fate and transport in the stream channel? This method of using rare earth elements in the channel itself was really effective. It was giving us really good data and data that we haven't seen in other studies. Overall, um, sediment we know is the second leading cause of stream impairments in the U.S. However, there's not a requirement for states to report sediment specifically on their water quality reporting things. A lot of states collect some of this data as part of habitat assessment or other, um, other questions they might have in the state, but I would recommend that based on how important it, this parameter is that we actually have some more focused reporting specifically on the forms of sediment and uh, how they exist across the states. We also reinforce the need for having regional assessments when we're looking at sensitivities to any kind of stressor, but particularly in this case, we saw that for sediment. And we find that I think that these thresholds that I've developed and that we can refine and be that are being developed in other states will find a lot of usefulness when we can apply them to restoration programs and in identifying stressors. Storage is a big part of sediment movement. I think sometimes it's underappreciated because a lot of times people think the fine particles are going to just flush right out and we don't have to worry about them, but we're finding that a lot of them are not flushing out and that's going to have an impact on our estimates of how long it takes between when we put a management practice into place and we see improvements in our streams. And finally, when we do, we're, we need a lot more research, uh, especially in fluvial fate and transport. This is a pretty new field. Sediment movement is not a new field of research, but a lot of it has focused on much larger particles, and we're finally reaching a point where we're getting the technology that we can really track these finer particles, and, and it's gonna be exciting to see where that research takes us. I wanted to acknowledge um, the institutions that have provided funding, both for my studies and for specific research portions of this. That's the Graduate School at Virginia Tech, the Biological Systems Engineering Department, the Global Change Center, and uh, the Virginia Water Resources Research Center. And also, a lot of people, particularly my committee, Cully, Leanne, Paul, and Larry, that has obviously been uh, a huge help in directing this research and kind of figuring out what's going on. I had a lot of field and lab help. Um, Laura and Dimitri are in the BSE department. Jolie's here, and she helped train me on that microwave digestion machine. I used trained me in the particle size analyzer. Jeff Parks conducted the ICPMS work, and Emma Jones and Jason Hiller with VDEQ, and they helped a lot with kind of making sense of that Virginia State data. I have collaborators on the flood project are Tyler and Ryan and Nate, um, and then also just everyone in the room here and who are associated with the Global Change Center, with the Biological Systems Engineering Department, um, with my colleagues at NSAFE who've really been cheering me on, and my friends and family. And of course, the Kamitas and Hessian lab members who are always here to cheer me on. <laughs>
And with that, I will take any questions. Yes? Any thoughts on why um, mathematics is a subject that you would take on uh, as a major? Yes. Uh, I would, my strongest inclination is it's adaptive, like an evolutionarily adaptive history. So there's two things you can look at. One is um, we're looking at a family level assessment. Those families are made up of a lot of genera of insects. So one, it's possible that in the Piedmont area, which has a higher conductivity sensitivity, we just have the genus, the genera that are there are more sensitive than the genera that are found in the mountain area. So we may not have the same mix of families in that measurement. But also, any organism that is like used to being in an area, of course, is gonna adapt to that area. So I think it could be a combination of those organisms just getting more used to it. The Piedmont is naturally uh, less stressed by conductivity than the mountain region, especially in the central Appalachian area. So, yes? Um, the measurements are sort of tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so embeddedness is very subjective because for a single particle, what happens is the biologist will you know, identify the particle and say, it's 50% buried, it's 75% buried. The Virginia method is uh, taken, it's 55 measurements. It's a length reach divided into 11 sections, five particles per section. There is uh, cross-training, so Larry actually does some of that training where they'll go have their team of biologists do that estimate, have a team from another region come in and do it again to kind of make sure we're getting similar measurements. But regardless, it's very subjective. And that's why I think there may, it may warrant really looking into other techniques that are less subjective to, you, to evaluate that particular parameter, especially if we keep consistently seeing that it's having such an impact. Mm -hmm. um, versus embeddedness being a measurement that is somewhat stacked, if you will, right, depending on when the genes are out there. So can you comment on that and how those can simultaneously populate? And I know you're skipping the genus and the story. Yeah. Story <laughs> well, Dr. Timpano is in the house, and uh, he has done a dissertation on that specifically, on the timing of conductivity, seasonal variation in conductivity, um, and how important it is when you take the measurement um, and then interpret it. So um, there is a, a time, <coughs> excuse me, a time component that matters. Um, well, also when they do these mesh metrics, they're going out at about the same flow level. So there's, if it's above a certain flow rate, they won't sample. Um, so that's one thing. But I think you know overall we find that the the way we're measuring it now basically works. If we tighten up our time frame, it's more reliable. Um, but I I put some I put enough confidence in the conductivity patterns based on how they're sampling it. Is that I'm not sure I'm answering your. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, of the U.S. EPA regions? Yeah. Region 4 is Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, like that okay. kind of area. So did you, when, when, when you were looking at that more large-scale assessment, are there uh, beyond, well, are there reasons why you think you saw a large, wide, wide segment that was possible in Tennessee, you think? Yes, and I reread that first paper yesterday <laughs> and was reminded of the painful analysis that we went through <laughs> to kind of think through that. Uh, there, one thing that influences that is just the straight out number of total maximum daily load reports that are done in each area. You're not looking at equal numbers. And that is driven by things like 
who where the EPA sued somebody. So they were really pushed to kind of make more TMDL reports come out. Sometimes um, New Mexico has a lot of sentiment impairments, but they're working on an approach to, to address them, so they aren't putting out TMDLs for them yet. So in some cases, it's not that there is an impairment, it's that the TMDL hasn't been written yet. Or in other cases, it can take from five to eight years on a good, in a good case scenario for that TMDL process to be completed. So we do have other states that have sediment impairments that just haven't been through that process yet. Virginia is really good with uh, looking at the invertebrate community and for, you know, obviously I started my studies looking at Virginia and that's kind of how I got into the sediment thing was it just kept coming up as a problem. Um, and in some cases also, some states don't emphasize that, that community. We have uh, northeastern states that are bigger, they're gonna focus on fish because of their economy. So that can have an influence too on what's being looked at and what's being focused on. So we got to 55 liters per second on each. We estimated based on some urban regional curves that that's about nine times um, a, a bankful event, a one and a half year return period. So not a huge flood, but a flood that we would see on a pretty common basis that would, which is relevant because that's kind of where the sediment's gonna be moving on a pretty common basis. I wonder about that. Um, we actually did do a, a sediment mats after the second flood to let a natural event come through and see what would happen. And I got so much organic growth on those mats between, I think it took a week before we got a natural flow event. Um, I think not at this point. That was in 2015 or 16. <laughs> And um, I don't think we would find them right now. But I think had we done it in the same season, that we would. But it would be interesting to look at some of those really depositional areas in the floodplain where why would it necessarily clear out of there, you know? So feel free to go sample that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think it, so there is some research that says it does bind more to smaller particles. The particles we chose to bind this to were pretty consistent in size. We actually tried to break them apart into size groups and found they were mostly conglomerates. So the more we tried to break them apart, the more they broke apart. Like you'd think you'd have them sifted, you'd be sifting for like a day. And then you'd like, but if we sift some more, it's still gonna break apart some more. So for our study, we controlled for the particle size, but in general, they will bind more to smaller particles. And one other thing is that these elements have a specific gravity of about three times the natural soil particle. That hasn't been indicated to cause a noticeable um, problem at the concentrations we're using, but it theoretically should cause them to sink faster. And I actually did see when I looked at just the labeled sediments and I was doing particle size analysis, it was obvious that the labeled sediments were settling faster, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right.